In May 1998, two nuclear explosions shook the world, one in the deserts of Rajasthan, the other in the mountains of Balochistan. After decades of secrecy, India and Pakistan officially joined the nuclear club, permanently reshaping the balance of power in South Asia. India's nuclear ambitions were driven by threats from China and Pakistan, as well as the pursuit of strategic autonomy, while Pakistan saw nuclear weapons as its only safeguard against India's conventional military dominance. Both nations developed their programs in secrecy, but by the late 1990s, an open nuclear showdown was inevitable. In this video, we explore the nuclear arms race between India and Pakistan, how they built their nuclear capabilities, and how the 1998 tests changed the region forever. India's nuclear ambitions took shape early, driven by security concerns and strategic autonomy. The 1962 border war with China, which resulted in territorial losses, and China's first nuclear test in 1964, were turning points for policymakers in Delhi. Lacking security guarantees from either Cold War superpower, both the US and USSR were unwilling to extend nuclear protection to regional conflicts. India saw an independent nuclear deterrent as the only way to counter Chinese aggression. With assistance under the Atoms for Peace program, India built the Cyrus Research Reactor at Baba Atomic Research Center in Mumbai in the 1950s. Canada supplied the reactor, while the United States provided heavy water, ostensibly for peaceful purposes. However, when the desire to develop nuclear weapons arose, India established a reprocessing plant by 1964 to extract plutonium from spent fuel, giving it a domestic source of weapons-grade plutonium. On May 18, 1974, India conducted its first nuclear test, Smiling Buddha, at the Pokhran Test Range in Rajasthan. It was an underground detonation of a plutonium implosion device, developed in such secrecy that even the Indian Army unit digging the test shaft was unaware of its true purpose. Though officially labelled a peaceful nuclear explosion, the test was widely seen as a demonstration of India's nuclear capabilities. Conducted 107 metres underground, it created a subsidence crater in the desert. The successful blast confirmed India's ability to design and detonate an atomic bomb without external assistance. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi reportedly informed only a small circle of officials. The successful blast was relayed to her with the cryptic message, the Buddha is smiling. While the test validated India's plutonium weapon design, the country did not immediately weaponize its nuclear capability. No additional bombs were built in 1974, and India maintained a posture of ambiguity regarding its arsenal. Internationally, the reaction was mixed. Canada concluded that the test violated a 1971 agreement and froze nuclear energy assistance for two heavy water reactors under construction. In contrast, the United States determined that the test did not violate any formal agreements and proceeded with a June 1974 shipment of enriched uranium for the Tarapur reactor. Pakistan, however, saw the test as anything but peaceful. It cancelled scheduled talks with India and accelerated its own nuclear weapons program in response. The Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission was established in 1956 and in 1965, Pakistan's first research reactor, supplied by the US, went critical under peaceful cooperation agreements. However, these efforts remained scientific rather than military. Security concerns soon changed this calculus. Pakistan viewed nuclear weapons as the only way to counter India's conventional superiority, a belief cemented by its defeat in the 1971 Indo-Pak War and India's 1974 nuclear test. In the 1960s, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, then Minister for Fuel, Power and Natural Resources, vowed that if India built a nuclear bomb, Pakistan would too, no matter the cost. Now, as president in the aftermath of the war that split Pakistan in half, that moment had arrived. He convened a meeting of top scientists in Multan and launched a crash program to develop the bomb. Pakistan's nuclear quest, codenamed Project 706, was led by Pakistan Atomic Energy Commission under Munir Khan. Initially, the plan was to develop a plutonium-based weapon, 
acquiring reprocessing technology and unsafeguarded reactors. Progress remained slow until 1975, when Dr. A.Q. Khan joined the effort. A metallurgist who had worked at the Urenco Enrichment Consortium in the Netherlands, Khan returned with blueprints for high-speed centrifuges, shifting Pakistan's strategy toward uranium enrichment. By 1983 to 84, Pakistan conducted its first cold tests in the Kirana Hills. These were non-nuclear detonation experiments, confirming Pakistan had a viable weapons design. U.S. intelligence was aware that Pakistan was nearing nuclear capability, but geopolitical circumstances forced Washington to look the other way. The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan at the height of the Cold War made Pakistan a key U.S. ally, while China, seeking to counterbalance India, became a major backer of Pakistan's nuclear program, providing centrifuge technology, weapon blueprints and even weapon-grade materials. By the late 1980s, Pakistan was believed to have assembled a small nuclear arsenal, and throughout the 1990s, it expanded its capabilities under Benazir Bhutto and Nawaz Sharif. While maintaining strategic ambiguity, conducting no tests and issuing no formal declarations, it also advanced its missile systems with support from China and North Korea. With both India and Pakistan steadily progressing, open nuclear tests were only a matter of time. India was the first to go public with its nuclear tests, driven by a Pakistani-backed insurgency in Kashmir, separatist unrest in Punjab, and political turmoil, as the newly elected Prime Minister Vajpayee fulfilled his promise to demonstrate India's nuclear capability. In May 1998, India conducted a series of five nuclear tests, known as Pokhran II, or Operation Shakti, marking its official entry as a nuclear power. The tests, carried out on May 11th and 13th, validated a range of nuclear weapon designs, including a thermonuclear device, a plutonium fission bomb, and three smaller experimental devices. Following the tests, Prime Minister Vajpayee formally announced India as a nuclear weapon state, asserting a credible minimum deterrence against China and Pakistan. India also declared a self-imposed moratorium on further testing and later adopted a no-first-use policy. Within 17 days, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif authorized nuclear tests at Chagai, Balochistan, and on May 28, 1998, Pakistan conducted five underground detonations in the Rasko Hills, publicly confirming its entry into the Nuclear Weapons Club. Two days later, a sixth test was conducted in the Karan Desert, likely to validate an alternative design. The tests were celebrated across Pakistan as a historic achievement that restored strategic balance with India. But the nuclear program was more than just deterrence, it carried deep national and ideological significance. With broad political support at home and backing from Muslim nations like Iran and Saudi Arabia, it was seen as a strategic asset for the Islamic world. Figures like A.Q. Khan became national heroes and the bomb emerged as both a symbol of defense and a source of national pride. Shortly after, Pakistan, like India, announced a self-imposed moratorium on further testing, having successfully demonstrated its nuclear capability. The global response to India and Pakistan's nuclear tests was swift and severe. President Bill Clinton imposed significant sanctions on both countries, cutting military and economic aid, while the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 1172, condemning the tests, urging a halt to nuclear weapons development and calling for a rollback of their programs. Japan, a major donor, froze aid and loans, while nations like Australia and Sweden recalled their ambassadors in protest. Yet despite international backlash, the tests bolstered national pride in both countries. India's government gained popularity for defying global pressure, while in Pakistan, public sentiment overwhelmingly supported the decision to match India's nuclear capability, even at the cost of sanctions. The nuclear tests fundamentally reshaped South Asia's strategic landscape. Both countries had now openly weaponized their nuclear arsenals, integrating warheads onto missile delivery systems like India's Agni missiles and Pakistan's Shaheen missiles. While nuclear deterrence prevented full-scale wars, it fueled lower-level conflicts. Skirmishes, 
cross-border firing along the line of control, and proxy warfare became more frequent, as both sides sought to advance their strategic interests while staying below the nuclear threshold. The 1999 Kargil War demonstrated this new reality. Pakistan's military infiltrated Kargil, confident that its nuclear arsenal would deter India from escalating the conflict. But India responded with conventional force, reclaiming lost territory while deliberately avoiding the international border, a sharp contrast to 1965, when a similar Pakistani incursion in Kashmir prompted India to launch a full-scale war. This time, both sides carefully managed the crisis, fully aware that any miscalculation could have catastrophic consequences. India's larger conventional forces, its advantage in tanks, aircraft and manpower, became neutralized by Pakistan's nuclear capability, which Islamabad explicitly considers a first-strike option against existential threats. India, by contrast, maintains a no-first-use policy, relying instead on guaranteed retaliation, including submarine-launched missiles. Ultimately, the 1998 nuclear test did not end conflict in South Asia. They redefined it, deterring all-out war, but creating an era of proxy battles and strategic brinkmanship. Has nuclear proliferation made the region more stable, or has it only made war more dangerous? Let us know in the comments below. I have been your host, Albert. If you have enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe. Until next time.